In this special episode of Voice of the Sea, we're on Hawaii Island as part of our series on local ia, traditional Hawaiian fish ponds. We visit the Kumuola Marine Science Education Center to learn about their efforts to rehabilitate the Vaiohole and Kapolaho local ia in the district of Hilo. We start off talking with Kumuola director Nalu Mead. We call our water here Vai'ava or Vai'kai. So Vai, of course, is our fresh water. Kai has been our seawater, and we're actually a nice mix of both of them. Our lokui is spring-fed, and it comes through our puna vai, and it makes about a four parts per thousand mix here of Vai'kai in our lokui. We actually have three fish ponds on site. So two larger ones, and one that's hidden kind of in the back, still under some overgrowth. And so our kuleana really encompasses those three fish ponds here at a program that we call Kumola. We have a scan map that's a compilation of a 1923 and a 1931, which as far as we know is the earliest maps we can find of this space that show eight lokuia here. One across the road, one, two, three, four, the road filled in one, um, five, five is right over there, six, and then there's two in the back, seven, eight. So we have actually eight named lokuia in essentially earshot of, of where we're standing. In about 2015, we kind of took this space back from leasing it out for, for different types of aquaculture. And we took it back and we looked at it as an opportunity to involve our keiki in our community, our, our kids in our community, and connecting them back to these spaces. At that time, we had a lot of overgrowth of California grass, some invasive trees. From October, last October to this October, we just did the math with our kids and we removed 35 metric tons of grass and sediment from within the Lokoya to create that habitat again. I hear some <laughs> of the avian wildlife, the birds. Can you tell me about some of the birds that you have here and are they different on this sort of fresher water local ia than they might be on the more salty ponds on the other side of the road? They are. We have this fun, we have this, we're this fun kind of vaikai habitat mix. We have our nene here. We had a couple just fly across. They're actually keeping us company here, eating our kihala. We also have some migratory birds that come in, our kolea, our hunakai, our ulili that come in this time of year right now. We had koloa mapu, which is our pintail ducks, which we've learned for the first time that they're a migratory species here in Hawaii. It's kind of this uh, field of dreams reference of build it and they will come. And we're just always so excited to, to come here and, and welcome new guests uh, <laughs> that, uh, that historically have been part of our of the systems. Does the fish pond now function where you, you're harvesting from it? It does. Every fish that we get in this local ya, we harvest with our kids. If you come down to a space and you build a relationship with a space, we call it pilina, you build a relationship with a space, a very important part of that is connecting with the resources of that space. A lot of our kids, a lot of adults in our community haven't had these fish that we have in these local ya. And these fish, these were revered. Right? The, the Ali'i Nui really enjoyed fish from these spaces because they're, they're momona, they were very rich. And so our goal really is to reconnect our kids with the, the taste, those, those tastes of this space. For us, a big part of it is having them harvest and go through that process. And then equally important is a consumption of those foods. So they put all their aloha and, and energy into these spaces and then they get to feed from it. Can you tell me then about the types of ia that you're growing and harvesting? Right, well, we're here at Vai Ahole, so um, water and ahole. So ahole waters, we believe, is uh, was the intent uh, uh, behind the naming of these spaces. So our ama ama, our native striped mullet, which is on my shirt, and our ahole are the two primary food fish that we have in this site. We do have some other invasive species and things that we are working on removing from the local uh, so that we create more habitat for our native species. So I see you have a number of volunteers today and they look like they're hard at work. What are they up to? Yeah, we have about 14 volunteers who are working with our other two kia'i right now, Trisha and Micah Lani. We call that a hali hali line where we pass buckets of sediment that has accumulated over time. They're scooping it out. We're on a nice uh, low tide right now. So they're scooping out that sediment and moving it up onto aina to, to build up our aina. Our ability to create habitat, we kind of have that philosophy of build it and they will come, right? Because we are a naturally recruiting system, we don't stock our fish. Really, their success in our lokuia depends upon the health of our lokuia. 
and by removing that sediment which we're doing over there some sediment and some california grass overgrowth we're actually creating an environment that's healthy for our fish and so when you describe the the amount like the volume of sediment and california grass you've taken out that's all been by hand like this that has all been by hand so our permit allows us to really remove this by hand with with folks in our community so right now we have a, a gap year program so some students who are recently graduated from high school going to college uh, or considering college and they're, they're doing some service learning in our community and we're really fortunate to have them lend their hands to learning our kind of philosophy of, of rehabilitation here but it really depends on our community it takes many hands to do the kind of work that we do for sure part of what our kuleana is too is to understand how do we work together as a community as a hui to to move this aina forward because behind us you can see we're making small little bites but these look we are all around us and how do we inspire those people to awamo kuleana to take on kuleana to find where these sit and where these live in our community again the the state introduced in 1953 a non-native mullet accidentally uh, in an introduction of sardines for our tuna fishery for our bait fishery since 1953 we've had a, just an overpopulation of this australian mullet that we call conda and we're finding that it competes with our native ama ama for resources and just population wise mm -hmm. in our near shore waters they, in, they outnumber our, our native species about 20 to 1. In the Lokoi'a, we're about eight and a half to one. We really want to have optimize our systems here for our native food fish um, that grow much larger. We did taste tests, they're much tastier. <laughs> With that in mind, we're trying to understand the cycle of recruitment in our system so that we can manage our makaha to allow for the uh, influx of things that we want and maybe give us options to keep those things that we don't want out. When they come into our Lokoi'a, they're about two and a half to three centimeters big, so they're really small. And at that time, we can't tell if they're our native ama ama or our invasive kanda. And so what we do is if we have large recruit classes, say 10 or more, we'll sample some of those pua, we call them pua when they come in. And we can tell through genetics with our high schoolers, and we can tell if they are a kanda or an ama ama. And then we can look at our graphs of recruitment and say, okay, here's seasons for when these different organisms enter into our Lokoi'a. And then it gives us as managers the ability to do something about it. And so what would you do? Can you talk to me about like, how would you manage your makaha? You know, this is a question for our kids, right? We always ask them, well, how do we do this? Um, you know, a lot of them come up with these ideas of, you know, maybe we block it, maybe we scoop them and put them in different ponds. It's really great to talk with our kids to have them build those ideas. One thing that we always make sure to do is our kids are part of the growth of knowledge and the management decisions in the space so that they have that ownership of, of, of the future of these ponds. This California grass that has overtaken our ponds has created so much more sediment than I'd say natural systems we're used to processing and handling. Wetlands always had microbes, always processed nutrients. That's what makes them so productive. Okay. But in this case, the overabundance of all that rotting California grass has created a situation where the microbes aren't optimizing their consumption of it. We end up with anoxic or no oxygen environments, mm -hmm. which create foul smells. There's a belief that they cause problems to our fish too. So some of the research that we're focusing on right now, we just started with one of our high school groups, a microbial digestion experiment to see if we can inoculate our loquia with beneficial microbes that'll consume, in some areas we have five feet of sediment that are going anoxic, which is never a good thing for your, your nose or the fish. So instead of taking buckets, can we have our native microbes activate and, and consume these resources? Our names, some of the are named in the back are hauna. So we have some of these scent names, which tells us that historically microbial processes were a part of these spaces. So when you talk about inoculating areas of the Lokoia with microbes, you mean you're actually injecting native microbes that might be able to work in a low or no oxygen environment in eat that material and break it down and then you, you won't need so much of the buckets. Absolutely. So we, we built these, uh, they're kind of balls that are made of mud and inoculated with, we, we put a little sugar in there, we put a little starch in there and they're able to form little communities. And those communities are what we then, after they have a chance to kind of grow in those mud balls, we put them in, we're testing it out and we're putting them into the Lokuia to see, well, will they consume those? Will they consume some of the sediment or not? Throughout the local, you'll see sticks that are lined up with little measurements 
and our high schoolers right. swim it with a mask and they look at the, set, the depth of the sediment to see over time if it has changed. And this only happened last week, so we'll see. I guess come back and we'll talk story if it worked or not. But right. we're always looking for solutions, solutions for our contemporary problems, right? Those, you, if, if, we don't, uh, if we don't look for or continually try to innovate and look for solutions to these problems, everything is changing so fast, we'll get, we'll get run over. So we always got to keep up and be innovative and try. We host groups from essentially kindergarten all the way to larger community groups or older community groups, I should say, and they can reach out to us uh, via our site. We, we really work with school groups the most, trying to, again, get those get our kids involved in participating in, in rehabilitation of a space, but more importantly, building connections with those spaces, right, so that they can promote healthy aina in their own spaces. My vision for the future or what I would love nothing more uh, to happen in the future would be for our kids to come back and, and become Kia'i, become managers and stewards of these spaces and spaces in their other spaces like us in their community and to enact their, their vision as they, as they build their knowledge base and they understand more what they want for their community. University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. You're watching Voice of the Sea. I'm the Innovation and Learning Consultant here at Kumola Marine Science Education Center. I'm essentially a, a Kumo, one of the educators, one of three educators here on site. What is it ab about this space that calls to you? And I have so much aloha for this space. To work with Keiki is, is hugely uh, something that just gets my na'au to be able to impact the lives of so many. To be able to take that classroom outside and, and be in a space that is hugely dynamic and constantly changing on the daily. Everything that we do here is dictated by, by the tides, by the weather. It's, it's fun, it's never stagnant, it's never the same, it's not cookie cutter. And, and I thrive in that kind of environment. And I think a lot of our people do. You know, we have a lot of keiki who don't necessarily fare well in the classroom. Uh, you bring them outside into this environment and they're a completely and totally different person. And, and to, to see that, to see that transformation, exciting. Riley, what are we looking at, Riley? Look at the centipede looking thing. Where did you find it? The hat the hat has centipedes. Centipedes. Uh, We found it in this. What is that? The and so I taught for over a decade Hawaiian language. And, and I think that that was an important building block, which has brought me to where I am today, to, to be able to connect language and culture and, and for the language and culture to thrive again outside of the confines of four walls of a classroom presented an amazing opportunity to bring my students from the classroom into these kinds of spaces where the language was relevant and real and applicable and wasn't so textbook. Those opportunities really provided me an opportunity to build pilina with a lot of my students and that kind of pilina that exists through today, you know, a decade later. While it's beautiful to, to have the science, I think it's, it's equally important to have the understanding of the language and the culture. Does it offer a different perspective when we're out here interacting in these spaces with students? I think absolutely, you can't have one without the other. We always say, he mana ko kainoa. There's a lot of significance, import, importance, and power and mana in our names. And those names are also indicative, potentially, of what these spaces functioned as historically. We have a lot of names that have sense, putrid sense, that are associated with them, like, well, we have Kapalaho. Is it Kapalaho? Is it Kapalaho? We don't know. Um, we have Honohono Nui, and, and is it Hohono, which is also a sense we have Hauna. So we have these spaces that have these scents, which I don't know, depending upon how you look, uh, which lens you're looking at it from, right? What the perspective is, are these spaces where they historically, did they historically function as sediment sinks? Does a sediment actually belong here? And when is it appropriate or not to insert ourselves into that system? And so 
Himana Kokainoa looking at those names, understanding the function of these spaces. As far as we know, we had cattle here on site in the 1950s, but absent the, the cattle, absent that biocontrol, we have nothing to kind of keep it in check, aside from us getting out there and physically removing it. We're in a vaikai environment. We're at about four parts per thousand. The California grass thrives in this environment. It can tolerate low levels of salinity. About a year ago, this was fully forested with invasives. We've been working diligently with groups like these community groups, Keiki from all over the continental US and beyond. So we're starting to remove the invasive grass and all of the associated in situ sediment that comes with that to expose the papa, yeah, the pohaku, all of our rocks that, that are below because the rocks are what limu grows on. Limu needs sunlight for photosynthesis and so it's this entire process. You remove the grass, all of the associated root mass and then all of the sediment, the in situ sediment, the sediment that, that occurs because of the, the years, decades of, of decomposition of this invasive grass to expose the papa so that the sunlight can penetrate, hit our rocks, grow our limu so that our ia can eat, creating an environment for our ia to thrive in. So our students right now are helping us to remove all of that sediment. To remove the grass is not enough. You have to catch everything that's under that. It really does take a lot of hands, a ohehana nui ke alu ia, to do that bucket by bucket. They're in their hali hali line, which we've found here has been super efficient in transporting sediment and rocks from point A to point B. It really helps develop pilina as well. We call it our locally a workout. So with the sediment right now, we're trying to level off certain areas that were apu'upu'u or, you know, just uneven aina. So we're trying to build up aina as well here. Dry land is a huge premium. It's exciting. It's exciting to be able to, to help a kumu in the classroom who's not super ma'a to be on an aina to make those connect uh, the connections to see that not just our science and our math which are our obvious connections but our our history our language our social studies our arts that all of those exist in these ex these spaces and it's a matter of bringing our students here so that they can get the full exposure and so we work with teachers across the gamut across all content areas to help make those connections We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero, be a teacher. You're watching Voice of the Sea. Here we have our mature ama ama, our native maleti, and our invasive kanda, the mar introduced Marcasian mullet. The smaller one is the kanda. The smaller one is the kanda. And you can see the difference in size. There's also the difference in some of their morphological features. The amama has a blue dot by its pectoral fin and they have these lateral stripes that go along the body. They also get substantially larger in size, so there's like a bigger fish, bigger food fish. It's at this size that they recruit into our local ia at mm -hmm. the Makaha. And unfortunately, when they're so small, we're not able to see these distinguishing fe features of lateral lines and that blue dot. It's at this size that we're also investigating the genetics and we're able to kind of understand their cycle of recruitment better, at least, for our local and in our space. With our native ama ama, we have that knowledge of their spawning season. And it's from December through March and from there, it takes about two to three months for them to recruit into our local, in, through the makaha. We're trying to understand this cycle when it comes to this invasive kanda, because we don't have much information as far as their spawning cycles. What we do know is that they're re 
recruiting into our makaha year round. Oh wow. Right now within our local ia, our native ama ama is outnumbered. So for us that's an issue because we want to have our native species thrive here and the fact that we have this invasive coming in year round taking up space eating at the same trophic level basically all the same limu that our native eats it's a bit of an issue so for us we're trying to understand these cycles of recruitment the best that we can so that we were able to identify who's recruiting into our local ia when and potentially work towards maintaining a higher native population than an invasive population. So we're just gonna head over on the Kuopa to our Makaha. It's our single entryway from the ocean into our local ia and it's very important to maintain the health of our local. So once the road was put in, it cut off our access to the ocean. And with that, we had a 147 foot pipe by three feet wide put in, which maintains our connection to the ocean. And it's here that all of our fish recruit into our local ia. We're a natural recruiting site, so we don't stock our ponds with any bought or outsourced fish. So the maintenance of this makaha is super important for the function and health and essentially well-being of our local ia. At least once a day, we have to come in and check our makaha for recruitment. Now, we don't have any pua recruiting at the moment, but this is where usually we would come and scoop them. The, it, the entryway actually gets blocked every day at low tide, but this offers us a unique opportunity to go in and collect our pua by hand, and we then count, size, and have a record of the last four years of recruitment data. One of our main food fish is the ama ama, and it's our native mullet. It, life cycle actually starts out in the ocean. So they come in at about, on average, three and a half centimeters, which we refer to them as pua. We put them into our pua ponds where we grow them up to a kahaha size. And then once they are kahaha, we release them into our larger local ia. And from there, they grow up into an ama ama. We actually do have large individuals, which we refer to as an anai, and that's the sizing. So pua, kahaha, ama ama, and then anai. This is kind of the issue for our local too, is that we have a lot of invasive trees that have been established, and their leaf litter actually blocks the flow of water. So on high tide, it's really hard for this exchange to happen. So this is kind of our everyday, everyday hana that we have to do. Oof. Local EO work really does take a lot of hands and you can help. Over 30 local EO across Hawaii are being actively rehabilitated. Get involved by participating in a community work day. Stay tuned for our next local EO episode or watch previous episodes about fish ponds online. Learn more at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.